Today, we are going to begin by talking about two things. We're going to talk about eschatology, and we're going to talk about master chef. Uh, eschatology, fancy word, it's the part of theology that is concerned with the end, or the end times. As soon as we put times on there, it sounds more looming, doesn't it? The end times. Uh, eschatology, the part of theology that talks about what happens when Jesus returns, maybe even not necessarily what happens, but the fact that Jesus does return, or that what happens when God does set all things right in the future, the, the future. It's about Christian hope. That's eschatology. It's about hope. And to do this, in some ways, I should have brought props. It would have been great. Um, we're going to talk about how we're going to use Master Chef, if you've seen that show, Master Chef, as an eschatological image. Okay, as an eschatological. I'm looking at Rob Dean here as the theology professor, going, "Oh, what have I gotten myself into here?" Um, but my family's a big fan of Master Chef. We watch uh, the Canadian one and the American one, and this uh, last one um, was called the Season of Legends. And so each uh, episode, they had a different celebrity chef that would come onto the show. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's basically just a, a competition, like a food competition, right? Uh, home chefs come together and they compete to, for the best dish and then they get declared master chef if they win the, the competition by the end. And so on this season of legends, they had a different celebrity uh, chef as a guest judge who was going to help judge the food for that day. And, you know, these shows, they're so spectacular, right? So they make a big deal of introducing whoever the guest is, whoever the celebrity is. And uh, Gordon Ramsay is kind of the key host. There's three, two other judges with Gordon Ramsay. But often he was the one introducing the guest because he's really good at, like, we, we always joke that he uses his arms a lot. Like, he's always good at, like, here we are, and this is going to be so great. We've got this amazing person, and here's Paula Dean. And I, I don't know how they produce it in such a way that it, you know, the... 12 or so people sound like it's this incredible cheer and thunderous applause or something like that. They just go nuts, these home chefs. Oh my goodness, it's incredible. There's excitement and there's awe and wonder because here's Paula Dean. Oh my goodness. Oh wow. How many of you know who Paula Dean is? Oh, quite a few. That's pretty good. Good, on, good up on your celebrity chefs. I'm going to guarantee you that there's a whole lot of people who have no clue who Paula Dean is. Um, I was one of those people. I was like, okay, Paula Dean, whatever. But I can guarantee you every contestant on MasterChef knows exactly who Paula Dean is, and they know who every other celebrity chef that's going to be introduced is, right? And they're just in awe. They all know who she is. And then for some of them, it sort of sets in, oh, oh my goodness, Paula Dean's going to taste my food. There's a little, like, it's great, but it's also scary, right? There's fear that starts to set in. I'm scared. And there's sort of this disbelief. Oh, my goodness, I can't believe I'm cooking in the same kitchen as Paula Dean. I've followed Paula Dean for so long, and I try to cook like her all the time, and now she's going to taste the food that I make. Oh, my goodness. This is, I think, an eschatological image, right? Jesus comes and, right, Paula Dean is there to judge their food. And she's actually, she was actually quite nice to, to people, which was good. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's an image of Jesus of, as judge that we have. People don't like that image. But I kind of think this is a good way to think about it. Jesus is there to kind of, uh, if we're, I followed Jesus for so long. I try to be like Jesus. I try to do the kinds of things that he's done. And I've, and I've looked at what he's taught, and I try to live my life in a certain way. And now he's here to see the kind of life that I have given. That's an eschatological image, right? Jesus returns and, oh, he almost judges without judging in a way, right? He judges just by his mere presence for those who followed him. Oh, my goodness. Excitement and fear wrapped up together. There's a line in 
uh, our passage today that says, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's talking about him coming again. Uh, the New International Version uh, translates it. What, what translation did you use, Melissa, by the way? Do you remember? Uh, the New Reader's Version. New Reader's Version, okay. Um, NIV says, as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. This revealed word, which is kind of what we're talking about during this series, the revealed word is a word apocalypsin. You'll hear apocalypse in there, right? And, and that just means revelation. This is why we have the book of Revelation, the apocalypse. And, and it's just a word that means to reveal or to unveil. So as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus to be revealed or unveiled. But hasn't that sort of already happened? Didn't the big reveal already happen? God in Jesus, and especially Jesus crucified and then resurrected? Hasn't that already been revealed? Isn't, didn't I kind of say that last week? And I'll say more about it in the next couple of weeks as well. Because yes, that, the decisive event has taken place, but there's... So, so there's, we have this new reality now that we can live in, but it's also a not yet. So this is the now and the not yet. Now, this not yet portion, this sort of, well, what will happen when? Um, there's several points in history where Christians have become sort of, I think, obsessed with the what will happen in the end times, especially the, like, what is going to happen? Um, or how it will work, and most importantly, when will it happen? And not just Christians, but actually Jesus got asked that same question. When, when is it going to happen? And our obsession with that over history at certain points, it makes some sense. The stakes are pretty high. And we love speculating as human beings. We love to dream. And another thing, too, is if we think we've figured it out, we also really love being right as human beings. And there are always people who love to tell other people that if they've got a different interpretation of the events, that they're wrong. There's some of those people who love to tell you when you're wrong. Now, the Bible always uses images, imagery, lots of imagery, often piled on top of one another to talk of eschatology, of judgment and salvation. And often these things are just wrapped up with one another. There is both a future orientation to those images and there's also a present orientation to those images. Some of the easier examples are in Jesus' own teaching. So many times Jesus says things like, the kingdom of God is like, you know, a mustard seed or, or like a farmer going and sowing seeds. And when he does that, he's talking about, in some ways, what will be, what will come. He's setting a particular vision, a hopeful vision, before his listeners. But it's really clear when you read what Jesus taught that it isn't just a description of a future that God will bring about and then, oh, we better believe in Jesus or we won't get to participate in that future. That's, it's really clear in Jesus' teaching that he's not just saying that. The vision that Jesus sets forth, and indeed the entirety of Scripture sets forth, is one that invites participation through faith and action and it invites it right away because it matters right now, not just in the future. The church is invited to live the now of the kingdom together while holding the tension that the kingdom is also not yet. To live the now of it, aware and admitting that we're not in the perfected vision of the future that Jesus is talking about. Admitting that we're not perfect, but we're trying to live it out. Uh, Mark Tranvik, commentating on this passage, he's the professor of, well, at the time he wrote this, professor of Ref Reformation history and theology at Luther Seminary. Uh, he wrote this about this section of this passage. Paul has no doubt that the decisive event in the history of the world has begun in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But this event is far from over. It continues until the Lord returns. This is the famous already not yet quality of the Christian faith. Our calling is grounded in Christ, and we have Christ's promise to strengthen our faith until he returns. 
but we claim nothing for ourselves. We must be especially mindful of our tendency to see ourselves as a finished product. When we slip into this kind of thinking, there is a temptation to see ourselves as an island of light in an ocean of darkness, and self-righteous rigidity is sure to follow. So our passage says, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, as you wait, and we still wait, right? We've had Christ revealed to us, but we still wait for the big reveal, right? And as I said, next week and the week after, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about God's revelation, particularly in the cross of Christ. In some ways, this week, where we put the word big, the words big reveal in the title of today's sermon, but it's not really about the big reveal, actually. It's actually about who we are in Christ as we wait for the big reveal. It's who we are in Christ as we wait. That's actually where Paul starts in this letter. Um, I'll just read to you the beginning part. This is the, the New Revised Standard Version. And... Um, So Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. That's just who's writing the letter. So ancient letters, always the writer of the letter first, and then the address to uh, who's receiving it. To the church that is in Corinth, those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul, (laughs) he's sometimes known for kind of going over the top with with how he speaks or how he writes. And here he goes over the top with this idea of being saints or being holy. It's the same word, essentially. Those who are sanctified or made holy holy in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, sanctified or saints or holiness. Holy is to be set apart, set apart. And there's something that always pops into my head is an illustration that I heard in a sermon years and years ago, more than 20 years ago, because I was a student. And it wasn't the best illustration. This is why, I don't know why this one stuck in my head, because it actually wasn't great. And we're always, as preachers, looking for good illustrations. I think maybe I should look for really bad ones so that they stick in people's heads and you remember, oh, it really wasn't that mad. Because that preacher that day helped me understand holiness in a way that I hadn't heard before because the illustration that he did didn't quite do what I was expecting it to do. Um, and it wasn't a great illustration. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it now, so hopefully it'll stick with you. Um, He talked about getting uh, new gloves for Christmas, new leather gloves and quite expensive ones, really nice ones. And uh, his old gloves were shot and it was just fantastic. So he was talking about like these new gloves, it's like this is what holiness is, right? Going to set these apart for only special occasions. Like this is, like that's kind of how, what it means to be set apart is these are set apart from the other gloves. Like these are the These are the important ones, right? We're going to set those things apart and only use them for the the, the right times. And they were really great for driving, so that's what they're going to be set apart for. They're going to be set apart for driving, and uh, and we're going to drive. It's going to be great. And as he is using them, like for the first or second time, I don't remember, it's 20 years ago, he, uh, he sees somebody stuck on the side of the road, and he decides... I need to help them. So he goes and he stops the car, pulls over, and, and this goes and helps them. He's got his gl- brand new gloves on. And he completely wrecks his gloves. Now the preacher's point, what, I was expecting him to make the point that, yes, this is exactly what holiness is. We're set apart for service. That, yeah, you dirty the gloves. And he didn't make that point at all. He said, actually, we need to learn that, some, that we need to keep things holy. And I totally messed up. I shouldn't have, like, I should have helped them, but I should have kept the gloves holy. What? 
this is why it stuck with me, because I'm thinking, what is he talking about? No, 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 no. Holiness, the whole thing. Sanctification is not about keeping yourself so pure that it never gets unsullied in the world. It's actually, we are set apart for that very activity of service, for that very activity of getting the gloves dirty, even to the point of them getting wrecked. Isn't that Jesus on the cross? So yeah, that stuck with me as a not it was almost a good illustration, but it didn't go the way I wanted it to go. This is what Paul is talking about when he writes to the Corinthians and says, you're called to be saints, that you're sanctified. He's not saying, and stay pure. He's saying, be saints in the world for one another and for the neighborhood, for the people around you. Paul continues and says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you. Uh, this word strengthened, and it showed up, I think, in... Um, maybe in one of the prayers too, or it's actually, it could be the word confirmed or established as well. Like I often think Jesus, yes, give me strength or, you know, help me be strong. But I kind of like this idea of the testimony of Christ being confirmed or established. And the Greek word is in. We say among because we don't, our English is not, it's a little harder, but I like in as well. But it's trying, among is because it's trying to say that the you is plural, which is right, right? So, but it's saying in you all, <laughs> right? So embedded in you, the testimony of Christ, or even Christ himself has been established in you, confirmed in you. And and he says, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's where it is, right? You are not lacking in any gift. Uh, Jane Lancaster Patterson, uh, so she's Associate Professor of New Testament and Community Care at the Seminary of Southwest Austin, Texas. And this, she writes about this, about spiritual gifts, which I really liked. It's the Greek word uh, charisma. If you've heard that, so where we get char uh, charisma from, essentially, charisma, um, or charism, where we get charismatic from, right? Um, and so it's, she says the NRSV renders charisma as spiritual gift. But again, we run up against the challenges of translation. Neither the Greek word for spiritual nor the word for gift is actually present here. A charisma is literally a grace thing. Grace thing. I kind of I love that. It's not a, a gift that becomes a, person, a person's personal property, like the gloves, right? It's not a gift that becomes a person's personal property. It's not some kind of special spiritual skill. A charisma is the gracious power of God for fullness of life on the move, seeking out every part of the creation where God's grace-bestowing life is needed. I love that. The Corinthian church has been dedicated and empowered by God for this purpose, to bring fullness of life to their part of creation. That's a charisma. Love that. Isn't that great? So that you are not lacking in any grace thing, this thing that we're talking about as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not just, you know, someone's, someone can help with the tech and someone can, uh, you know, set up the stage and someone can read scripture. Those are all good things. But hear how big this is, right? And you are not lacking in any of that. You have it all. It's all been given to you. He Jesus will also strengthen, same word, confirm, establish, ratify, might, you might even say, he will establish you or confirm you to the end, back to eschatology, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't always like the word blameless because it has the word blame in it, 
Another way to say this is without reproach. So if we're exercising this, these, this grace thing that we've been given that is in us and established in us by Christ, he will, it, it's actually Jesus that will confirm that to the end so that when he shows up and there's the big reveal, you, you plural, are without reproach. And he's the one who's done it all on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The dependence for the future is resting on Jesus and Jesus' work in us. And Paul concludes this little section by saying, God is faithful. Right? Because we often want to make this, we we always want to just push on this and say, well, this is really actually about, like, this is about us and our good behavior, right? Like, we, we need to get our behavior in line, don't we? Isn't that what this is all about? I'm a good person. And, and Paul continues to remind and, and say, in case you didn't get it, that we're actually talking about God and God's faithfulness. God is faithful to us. God is faithful by whom you were called into, uh, it says, the partnership of his son. It's actually, there's no the, it could be into partnership, into koinonia is the Greek word, into fellowship, partnership with his son. But again, our English often gets into the partnership because it's trying to say it's the church because the you is plural, which we don't get in English. So they need to construct these sentences, but you sort of miss some things that you were called, you, plural, together, were called into partnership with Jesus. Paul returns to this whole idea of community with Jesus. The community of Jesus is the community with Jesus. You'd think the whole thing should be, and so therefore you need to stay faithful to God because Jesus is coming, so you you better make sure you individually, each one of you, do all the right moral actions But Paul's conclusion in this little section, in this intro to his letter, is, oh, hey, church, God is faithful. God is faithful. God calls you, all of you, together into this partnership with his son, Jesus. You are not lacking in any grace thing. That that gift given you for for the benefit of the community and for the wider neighborhood and for the world. God has made you saints, set apart, called you, a holy people that serves together. You have been enriched in Christ. What an awesome community. The words that are shared among you the knowledge you've been given, the gifts that you have, Paul says, it's all so good. Is he just writing to a church in Corinth 2,000 years ago? No. He's writing to us. He's writing to us, to Prairie Presbyterian Church. Enriched in every way, God is faithful. Amen.